Hi, I'm Carrie Stevens. Author of Unrated Revelations of the Rock and Roll Centerfold. I'm just a magazine. Yeah, you just smile in the picture sales. Look what that does to And you're listening to Play That Rock and Roll. a test this is play that rock and roll podcast edition i'm your host joseph k and like the song at the start says just call me joe today our guest is carrie stevens author of unrated revelations of a rock and roll centerfold unrated is carrie's memoirs which include several connections to rock and roll carrie's most famous connection to rock was her relationship with eric carr Eric Carr was the drummer from KISS who passed away tragically young in 1991. Carrie met Eric in the late 80s, and she was in a relationship with him up until his passing. After that, Carrie turned her focus to her showbiz career, which included modeling and being an actress. She eventually struck a deal with Playboy magazine and became Miss June 1997, and she continued to work with Playboy for several years after that issue. She enjoyed success in both movies and TV, and was even featured prominently in a music video for a song by the band Third Eye Blind. Another rock connection in Unrated is Carrie's rather unique friendship with David Lee Roth, as Roth appears several times throughout her story. In fact, one of Carrie's first concerts was Van Halen in 1984, and that one concert sparked a lifetime fandom of that 80s style rock and roll which is something many classic rock fans can identify with. In the interview you're about to hear, we discuss her decision to self-publish Unrated and how she designed the book's presentation. We talk about her complicated feelings regarding Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley from KISS. We discuss her unique friendship with David Lee Roth, and we even talk about how she survived a rather abusive relationship with former NFL quarterback John Elway. Unrated is definitely a project that classic rock fans should support because much of Carrie's life was spent around some of our favorite rock stars and she got to see a side of them that's not typically available to us the fans. And her observations aren't going to make it into any official band biographies. Her stories are the real deal. And I've said this before, classic rock is a boys club, too much of one. So it's important for us as fans to seek out women's perspectives as those stories are vital parts of the greater classic rock history. So go to carriestevens.com and get this book. In fact, you should do what I did. Get yourself a signed, personalized copy as part of a VIP package. They're reasonably priced, and like I said, all personalized. And after that, make sure you find her at carriestevensxo on Twitter and Instagram, and she's got a public Facebook page as well. So with that, Here's my interview with Carrie Stevens, author of Unrated, Revelations of a Rock and Roll Centerfold. When I first heard about this, I heard that you self-published. And when I got this book, my jaw dropped because I own a couple of self-published books and they don't look like this. Like the presentation and I here. I didn't, and I didn't have to tell anybody that, but you know what? I had, I had a huge agency in New York that was repping it. They had it for a year and they didn't do anything with it. And it's a huge agency. So I think I was lost in the dust. They just, they, they have huge stars. And um, when COVID happened, about three weeks into the pandemic, I said, you know what? I'm not waiting for yeah. permission for and for anyone else to do it for me. I'm not. I'm. I don't care what anyone says. I'm. I'm getting it done because we might not have tomorrow. So I took matters into my own hands, and I hadn't read my book in about a year. So I picked it up. I read it, and I said, "Wait, that, that that's not the end. That's not the end because that whole last chapter. You know, when I traveled it." 
the Dominican Republic and Italy and Ireland by myself. That I think that might be my favorite. Well, I it's hard to pick a favorite chapter, but mm -hmm. I still love reading that one. And I penned that. It uh, didn't take me long. Um, I just knew that the previous ending wasn't the ending because I had had such an exciting year full of revelations. And mm -hmm. that was the ending. And so I wrote that. And then it took me about four months to sift through all of my old memorabilia. And as you see the book, I carefully placed in the perfect timeline, yeah, my images that went with each chapter, concert stubs, like all the memorabilia that helps to uh, tell the story. So no one did this for me. I put a lot of work uh, into this, my heart and soul into this. Um, you know, the only thing I didn't do was, you know, I had to hire a book designer to do the techie stuff, but I designed the cover oh. and everything. Like I saved everything just to have someday, but I literally did like paper dolls. Like I would, you know, print out the photo of the cover. Yeah. I'd like cut and then I'd like paste like where I wanted the title, where I wanted everything and then scan it and send it to him like, and to show him exactly what I wanted. So I was really, like hands on, but you know, it's my life story. So I, I didn't, I didn't want anybody else doing it. Like I wanted it um, the way I wanted it. Cause it's my life. Well, that makes perfect sense. And like I said, this doesn't look like a, a self published book. This looks as professional as it gets. And I have to wonder, you know, your, your background, you have some, you know, background in, in the magazine industry with, you know, Playboy and other things. Did that, did your exposure, to that industry help you sort of design the, the, the presentation yeah, and package? Sure, I, I had a vision. I mean, I wanted my cover to look like the cover of a Playboy magazine and mm -hmm. I hired Playboy's people to shoot it. I hired their makeup artist, I hired their photographer to come to my house, but I stuck them in the third week of the pandemic to shoot that. Um, so I had that vision. I didn't have a wardrobe. I had to, I bought that bodysuit for Am on Amazon for 30 bucks because I couldn't go shopping oh, during the God. pandemic. Yeah, so uh, I pulled it together rather, uh, it looks great for me pulling it together like I did. And then, um, yeah, I think, you know, I have an unusual life where I just happen to have so many modeling photos from a very young age. So I like from 18 on to the present, I was able to start every chapter with a beautiful um, headshot, you know, from the timeline that they're all from the timeline that uh, the sequence of the chapters, because they tell you not to write a, if you read about how to write a book, they'll tell you not to write it in sequence. Yeah. But I, and I did that. I did it anyway, because to me, that's the only really, that's the only way it made sense to me. Oh, sure. I don't know how other people do it. I just did it the way it made sense. But yeah, after, when I got serious about writing a book, um, if you're going to get a publisher, what you're supposed to do is write a list of competitive works so you can pitch yourself to the publisher and you can tell them who your competition is. Um, so I read a lot of memoirs trying to figure out like who I would compare mine to, but there's nobody exactly... There's nobody, you know, there was, luckily I didn't really need the list because I ended up self-publishing, but, yeah. you know, I read a, a, a few, like Janice Dickinson, who was a top model, and her first was really good. I thought it was very entertaining. Uh, Bobby Brown is a good friend of mine. She oh. wrote Cherry, um, Cherry on Top um, and uh, Dirty Rocker Boys. So, um, of course, hers, hers is very different than mine, too, because it's like, you know, she went down more of like, you know, the drug, wild Tommy Lee, you know, like a wilder kind of um, path. And, and hers is great and very entertaining, but um, again, like very different uh, than mine. And uh, I read some b books by some uh, feminists um, that I'd never heard of because um, there's a feminist element. Not that feminists would agree with me or my choices, um, but I'm an independent thinker and if they actually listen to me, they might agree with some of what I say, but I'm not going to get their attention, uh -huh. I don't think. Um, but there's, uh, what's her name? Something Valenti, read her book. Um, yeah, a few, you know.
Yeah, sounds like you enjoyed it. A couple it wasn't of those. like I'm with the band. It wasn't like it, it's not really a groupie story either, you know. No. And it's not like it wasn't a Holly Madison down the rabbit hole. I'm not talking. Um, I'm not talking about one thing. Like it's like it's not a book about Playboy. It's not a book about Kiss. It's not a book. It's really just about um, me. <laughs> yeah, you are the constant. But what's uh, really appealing about the book is that even though it sort of weaves in and out of rock and roll, every story is engaging. And I'll be honest, I, I, I knew of you because of your social media presence and, you know, your relationship with Eric. But, you know, all the stories uh, with uh, John Elway and, and your travels to Ireland, I mean, all that stuff was, was new to me and it was all very captivating. So I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. I really love Ireland, really do. I'm hoping to be able to go back um, I've always wanted to go. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard great things. And I see on social media, you post some great pictures. It seems like an amazing place. Yeah, I post, I post a lot. I've been, I've, I spent nine weeks there the last time I was there. The time before I spent five weeks and the time before like, two weeks. So mm -hmm. every time I go, I stay longer and longer. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I think about moving there someday. We'll see. Oh sure. So let's uh, let's pivot to some of the stories that are that are in your book. I know you've discussed uh, your your relationship with Eric basically on all sorts of other podcasts. That's so I, usually only we want to do. Yeah, and well, and it's and I will say to your compliment. I mean, the stuff with Eric is some of the most heartwarming beautiful stuff in the whole whole book but it's also unfortunately some of the most heart-wrenching but I, I so I, I know you've talked about it at length and and everything's out there I guess my only question about that is at this point in your life when you hear music that he was involved with creating is that comforting or is that difficult it's um, difficult mm, makes sense it's do you, do you generally avoid Kiss music as a whole nowadays? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't change the channel anymore. I mean, like in the first couple of years after he died, it was way too difficult. I had to change the channel. I mean, oh, yeah. if it comes on the radio now, I, you know, shrug it off. My son's more to change it because he's worried about me getting upset if it comes oh. on. But I, no, I'm okay now. I just, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't get it is what it is. And it's like my friends apologize. Like if it comes on when they're with me, they're like, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, it's okay. Kiss is everywhere. Like, yeah, I, I have to live. I have to live with it. I mean, I don't hate their music, but yeah, it brings up the, that time of my life that uh, I have to like push it down. Um, you know, before social media came out, uh, and if it wasn't out, my relationship with Eric probably would be um, forgotten by most people because um, it was when the internet came out that um, I started getting, you know, almost immediately, like in 1988, like way before I talked much about it public, like I would get all kinds of KISS fans writing me like through my website and, um, it wasn't always nice. I mean, thankfully now, yeah, I had weirdos back then. And thankfully, I think they're gone. But um, yeah, uh, now now I get mostly just people writing to be thanking me for keeping his memory alive or telling me stories about, you know, when they met him and what a great guy he was. So that's nice now. But, you know, it took me many years to get used to because people still do it you know they have his picture up as their profile picture they friend me with it and you know and it, it's it in the first few years it was always it took me it just took me by surprise every time now i'm so used to it it's like across my feet all day it's just yeah. you know i get a little emotional uh um on the anniversary of his death and on his birthday those are those are the times that i i get um misty about it but sure. most other times i'm okay yeah that uh that definitely seems to be very difficult you know given that you know some of them are probably well-meaning but they're kind of 
maybe a little clueless about how it's coming across. But in any case, like, the, the, the KISS fandom seems to have, like, truly embraced you, and I've seen you've done convention appearances and your fan events. Has, okay. have, have those events uh, sort of, did that help you get over some of that uh, initial pain of them, you know, initially reaching out to you? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was afraid uh, to do that kiss convention because of the, okay, just uh, so, yeah. because of those long ago strange um, uh, people that would message me. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I was a little bit scared, and then Bruce Kulick talked me into it. He, you know, convinced me kiss fans are great and actually i'm glad i'm glad he did because you know what? i've made friends with a lot of them a few yeah. a few of them i keep in touch with all the time and we don't we don't even really talk about kiss or eric anymore like that's just how i met them and i've done a lot of their podcasts and some were just fans that i signed for there and um and i used to have this policy especially on my private facebook page i would only accept people that I've met in person and I tried to keep it very small, but then yes, that kiss convention ruined it because then I felt like I had to like accept everybody that I met there. And then I was like, ah, I'll just keep it public. Um, but yeah, like I said, like I, every, everyone I met there was nice. I didn't have a problem with not one person. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting with, with Kiss, and this is my last question about them. Um, oh, you can talk about it. It's okay. okay. I, th- and I laugh and I say it's all anyone wants to talk about. I mean, I'm proud of Eric, and, and he would be so honored that we're talking about him and that people are still interested in him. Um, so I don't want you to feel you know bad about asking me about it. Well, that, that's all right. But you know what? what's interesting? I mean, truth be told, uh, I, I do like Kiss to a degree, but I'm not a super fan. I did look it up, though, and I found it uh, kind of interesting that, that my favorite Kiss songs are, like, start and end with Eric's time in the band. Like, that's the only era of the band I really, truly like. So I like to think that he's the, the that secret factor that, that made them work for me. But my, my question to you about Kiss is more in regards to... You know, your complicated um, relationship with the, that fandom and that world is, is not just about Eric. Is There's stories in your book about your interactions with, with Gene and Paul, and those weren't always positive. In fact, it sounds with Paul, they well, weren't very positive. You know, it's not really like they treat it. I'm not saying my interactions with them were bad. I mean, uh, it was more my... Um, opinion later about um how they treated eric in the end um you know he had a great relationship with them for you know 11 years or something and then his last year with the band was rough and then he got sick and they didn't handle it well and um of course you know i wasn't happy with um them for the way that they treated him i think I don't want to speak for them, but I think they realized they could have done things better and differently. And it was a tough time. Everybody was under pressure. Nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. They were coming from a business perspective. I was coming from, you know, the perspective of somebody that was his girlfriend that was at at every doctor's appointment. I was in the hospital bed with him. I was seeing the pain. I was feeling the pain as if I were the patient. So, and they weren't there at all. So, um, yeah, so my my relationship um, was emotional. I wish theirs had been a little bit more emotional for them and they had more compassion. It seems like they were more about business and they're notorious for being about business. Um, Gene and I never had any, uh, they were never, no, no, not, they were never mean to me or rude to me personally. Um, and Gene and I remained friends, you know, later on we became friends and, you know, I told him exactly how I felt about all of this and he was all ears and he put me on the cover of his magazine and he quoted everything I said, including, you know, that I hated them for what they did. And that, and that made me respect him um, because, you know, he's a very outspoken person, but if you're like, you know, if you're going to be outspoken and you're going to have your opinions, you have to allow other people to speak too and to have their opinions. And he does that. So that's cool. Um, 
I don't really, I'm sick of, you know, bashing Paul because every time I say anything bad about Paul, some podcaster has a headline like, next up, why Carrie Stevens hates Paul Stanley. Oh, sure. And yeah, they, you know, to get, to make it uh, sensational. And I'm not saying I hate Paul Stanley. I'm saying that he did some things, you know, yeah. that I, that are, were rude and wrong, um, like exploit me in his own memoir. And I think I deserve to defend myself, um, you know, because he wrote it in my his memoir, like Eric was dating some playmate. By the way, I was not a playmate when he died in 1991. I was right. 22 years old and my, uh, I was Miss June 1997. So don't sensationalize me. Don't even give me a name. I'm just some playmate. When it, that, do you need more sensationalism? You're Paul Stanley, yeah. you know? So really need to uh, use me. Eric's girlfriend, a Playboy playmate he'd been with for several years, briefly took the drumsticks out of the casket for some reason, and Eric's fingers moved as she did. So I didn't like that, and I didn't like that he said uh, that I acted bizarre or, you know, at, the, at his wake and took his drumsticks out of his hand, which was a complete fabricated lie. And I don't know if he had a ghostwriter that made that up or if he made it up. So I'm not saying I hate Paul, but I'm sure he had to approve it and edit it. And it was just wrong. You know, it was, it was, he took like the most painful moment of my life standing over my boyfriend's coffin and exploited that in his memoir. And I chose not to put it in my memoir because my book is not about Paul Stanley. It's about me. Um, so I didn't go there, you know, but I have been vocal about it in interviews because I think, I, I think that's the proper place to discuss it is more, in an interview about the book, I didn't want to make my book about him. So that's not there. So, but that, that's my, my, my feelings. And besides that, I, I think I've been extremely fair in um, my interviews, you know, when I've been questioned about how they treated him, because there's tons of rumors swirling, you know, amongst the fans. And um, I get accused of all kinds of things. I get accused of not telling the truth. I guess people just don't want to listen to my, podcast or read my book because you wouldn't believe the amount of people um but you know what for every thousand love letters i get you know one psycho hate one saying you know is anyone ever going to tell the truth about gene and paul firing him and yeah they did they didn't exactly fire him but they tried to get him to resign right you know they were pressuring him while he was on his deathbed uh, to resign um and he did not, he never signed those papers. He did, he was not going to, and he, so yeah, that, that, that pissed me off because I, I didn't want him to be stressed out. I wanted him to, you know, relax and heal and any girlfriend, wife, whatever, you know, we, that's, anybody would feel like I felt. So it's not that controversial what I'm saying. I just, you know, I would have liked everyone to be, you know, loving, believing that he was going to be okay and, and not stressing him out while he was sick. Is that too much to ask? Right. That's really all I'm saying. And, and, and that happened. And I've been extremely fair in saying that, you know what, I think if they could go back and do things differently, they probably would. I mean, oh, sure. like I said, it all happened very quickly. And I would like to think that they would. I don't know. I'm not psychic, but giving the benefit of the doubt, I would like to think that. It's, it's yeah. It's obviously it's a very very complicated issue, and it, it's just too bad that you know Paul decided to be tacky about it or tacky about you in his book. I'll never get an apology or anything like that, but I bet he regrets he did that too. Because how can you feel good about doing that? You know, yeah. I think a lot of people just do mindless things, and I try to have compassion for people, even Paul Stanley. But you know what? I've done some things not quite that bad, but you know, I've made some comments sometimes on. Twitter and then, so, and then I went, uh, you know, maybe I should have like worded it different or stayed out of that or not, you know, so well, people it, make mistakes, but that was a bad one. <laughs> yeah. And I almost wonder with Paul, and this is just me speculating. I wonder if that was just a coping mechanism for it. Like maybe he just couldn't deal with some of his own internal guilt for how he treated both you and Eric. And he just kind of took it out in anger. But anyway, we, we, we can, we can move past Paul. I wanted to, to circle back to, to this magazine that you mentioned with Gene. This magazine cover of Tongue Magazine uh, came out in fall 2002. I have the entire run of Gene Simmons' Tongue Magazine. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. 
But the people on the covers are your old friend Hugh Hefner, uh, Jack Nicholson, Snoop Dogg, and Jenna Jameson. I'd say that's pretty good company. Yeah, I only have my one issue. I don't have uh, the other. Well, that yeah, that's that's fine. How how did uh, how did Jean approach you to be on the cover of this issue? Um, actually, I used to see Jean at the Playboy Mansion a lot because, um, well, because Shannon was a playmate, so they were at a lot of the same, you know, half had parties all the time, you know, like Oscar night, you know, uh, Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas, movie night every weekend. So I would, I'd see them quite a bit. And, um, so we had a few years after, you know, after Eric died, I didn't see them for many years and then. Uh, seeing Jean there a lot and um, back then Kiss wasn't doing all that much I mean he approached me to do a few things I got asked to pose nude they did a Playboy issue you know a bunch of uh, girls nude with Kiss and I was like uh, that's too weird I, I, I didn't do it because I, I can't stand around naked in front of those guys and then um, you know he asked me to do some comic book conventions with his son Nicholas and dressed up as a hero, but I was busy traveling the world for Playboy. I didn't have time to uh -huh. do it. What I'm saying is, like, John, Jean reached out to me, you know, for several um, projects, never offering to pay me, of course. Oh. Um, yeah, but then it, I ended up actually. He, so when I he called me one day and told me he had a magazine and asked if I would be a, a feature, and um. I just had my son and we did a photo shoot and we did the interview and, and then he didn't, he didn't like, I loved the interview, but he didn't like it. It wasn't scandal. It wasn't scandal. What the writer wrote, I loved, but he did Gene didn't think it was scandalous enough. So he invited me over his uh, house. He wanted to do his own little interview with me where he yeah, like, you know, asked me what celebrities I've slept with and things that, mm -hmm. you know, Gene, Gene likes the tabloid this stuff. Um, Clickbait. So yes, or and it was that it, it was that day. Um, I had my modeling portfolio with me, and I showed him my portfolio, and that covered the magazine cover photo that was in my modeling portfolio. And he was like, "Oh my God, this is it! Like this is the cover." And he asked if he could use it as the cover. So I. Asked it and he asked to use it and that was that <laughs> oh nice okay that's that's a that's a cool way to do it well is he a good interviewer depends what you're looking for <laughs> you know like I, well i liked i liked the beautiful uh professional i don't remember his name the professional writer that wrote the long article yeah um it was beautifully done but gene had something else in mind like gene wanted some smut like yep. he wanted to know like who I've slept with and but it was kind of cool like I said because he also it also gave me a chance to just look right in his face and say you know I used to hate you right and he was like tell me tell me everything I want to hear it all say and I was like okay and then I just went in for the kill and he printed every bit of it yeah so that's why that's but that was that was where my healing uh, really happened. And that's where, you know, uh, I let go of all of um, my resentment and had a newfound respect um, for him. Paul and I never had <laughs> that same healing. Of course, I bumped into him many times over the years and I was always, you know, polite and he was polite and we never had an issue it was just oh, my you know my main issue was just like that that he wrote that in the book so sure. we already covered that but you know that's oh it. yeah so with uh with tongue magazine you know obviously you know it only ran the five issues you know again going back to your your background with uh playboy and you know you have some insight to that magazine industry when you saw what gene was doing with this magazine did you notice anything that would maybe explain why it didn't uh, didn't turn out to be a long running thing, or do you think he just lost interest? I knew his partner in New York, who was an established um, publisher. I never asked that question. I'm assuming it was a financial issue because usually when things fail, it's because they weren't profitable. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was so busy with my own modeling and acting career back then that I didn't follow it. I'm assuming, um, and I don't, I could be wrong because I'm, I could be, but I, for a while, magazines were all transitioning to online and it was hard to sell them um, because everything was been given, giving, oh, been given away for free on the internet. Um, so that, may, I, I, again, I'm not sure about the timeline because I don't remember when that issue started happening, but maybe, maybe that was it, I don't know. Oh, interesting. So uh, I have a couple more magazine questions for you. This has always been a curiosity of mine, particularly with Playboy. So when, when you were around Playboy, was it common after you got the cover for Playboy, was it common for competing magazines to try and poach you to do their magazine? Was it controversial for, for no, women you, to do you both? Sign con you sign a contract um, when you do Playboy. But, oh, but, okay. Yeah, well, for two years, you cannot do nudity for any other, um, anyone. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's a couple girls that, like, as soon as their contract was up, they went and did penthouse and porn. But it, just, you know, a handful. Um, most of them were quite, um, you know, normal. They got married, had kids, mm -hmm. had, or started different careers. Um, uh, I'm probably one of the rare ones that stayed with the entertainment business that long. Mm -hmm. um, because I was already an actress before I did Playboy. Right. Um, so... My end goal wasn't Playmate. I was using it as a stepping stone for other things. And it worked well. I yeah. got a lot of work after that. Oh, for sure. Um, so it wasn't controversial if, if women would go from one magazine to the other years later? It wasn't uh, like a taboo or anything? Not to, you know, it would be. But I mean, only if it was like Penthouse or a, another nude magazine. Right. <clears throat> you know, if it was Maxim or FHM, they would be yeah. proud. I mean, or... Um, almost anything. I mean, they, they were really supportive of, uh, of us doing anything except, um, yeah, the raunchier things. Oh, or, I see. Like yeah. direct competitors yeah, too? Yeah, they us employed. I mean, I worked for Playboy for 20 years. They kept shooting me over and over and hiring me, not just to do, um, in-person promotions all over the world, attend events and parties and host things, but also, and photo shoots and catalogs, but you know, they would get us outside um, work too. They had an in-house modeling agency. And they also had, um, they, I got hired to give tours of the mansion all the time and you know, go to sporting events with oh, yeah. uh, advertising clients they had and people from the company, <laughs> you know, come to the office and surprise the employees to sign autograph one day. I mean, they, they kept me, if you were good to them, they were good to you. And I had a very good relationship with Playboy. Oh, that de yeah, that definitely comes through in the book. Were, were some of the opportunities that came to you um, from your association with Playboy for music videos? Uh, I think the only one I did, I'm trying, the third eye blind never let you go, but uh, they did not get me that audition. I'm trying to remember what agent got me that now. All right, well, that doesn't matter. I went on the audition, I got the job, and that's when music videos paid very well. Oh, sure. Uh, that was great. Could you tell us a little bit about what it was like shooting that music video? I mean, you're, you're like climbing up a ladder of people. It's, it's a real interesting video. Human's chain of uh, people and, uh, yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I remember Stephen Jenkins uh, was like flirting with me the whole time and he was dating Charlize Theron and uh -oh. she was sitting, yeah, she was sitting in the director's chair, like just watching and he would come up and he, she'd think he was like saying something to me, like to direct me. And he was like whispering <laughs> sweet nothings in my ear. And I was like, Oh my God, like, why is he flirting with me when he's got her? But that's what rock stars do. But anyway, he, He's a sweet guy, I guess. I, not if you're dating him, but I thought he was nice. Um, I'm sure she wouldn't like that story, but they're long gone. And um, yeah, but yeah, it was 
the other guys in the band were nice. Like, they, I had a body double. So when you see the, um, the, I did some of the climbing, but they had a stunt girl uh, body double that did like a lot of it. If you look really close, you can see the difference in the hair. Oh, but, okay. uh, yeah. So I would do like the easy shots of, you know, like in the close ups and the hair blowing when you see me. But if you really watch, you know, the fast climbing and stuff, it's my body double. <laughs> <laughs> That's real cool. Have you, well, that, I did have to do the, the uh, harness and the green screen, some of that, which was fun. Was that, was that a multi-day shoot or was it just in one day? Two days. Two days. Oh, okay. All right. Have you done any other music videos? I did a Lizzie Borden video. Um, that was my first oh. job ever in LA. And um, it was it's one of the top five worst music videos of all time, if you Google it. Um, we've got the power. I think the third eye blind was definitely the only big successful one that I did. This is like crazy because like, sometimes I have to look at my own resume to see what I've done, but my music videos are not on my resume, so <laughs> I don't know. Did you ever? Uh... Me how come Kiss never used me in any uh, music videos or modeling? And I'm like, well, I wasn't anyone yet. Like I was yeah. a kid. I was uh, 19 when I moved to LA, and. Um, 22 when Eric died. Again, I wasn't a playmate until I was 28. And that's when Gene started asking me to be a part of his projects. I think had I already been a playmate back then, they mm -hmm. probably would be in things, but they didn't even think of me that way. You know, I wasn't there yet. I just wasn't doing it yet. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, let's, let's stick with music. Um, one of the reoccurring characters in Unrated is a favorite of all of ours, David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth was actually, for me, the last concert I saw before COVID hit. I saw his Vegas residency. How was that? I wanted to go, but I didn't. I, I had a great time. I had a really good seats. Uh, he seemed to be just so happy to be performing again. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think he was because on, well, I only saw his social media, but he certainly seemed excited about it. Am I dreaming or did I hear he was going back on the road with Kiss for the end of the road tour? Yeah, yes. And he did just a, a couple of shows opening for them, but this is all like end of March. Like I saw him in uh, January, and, or I shouldn't even say yeah, end of March. Is it a gig that's not coming back? Or? I'm not sure. I think it is coming back because he had, he had booked dates in March, but those all got canceled. I got lucky. I saw the first round in January. So he only did three so dates 20, 20 correct three book in 2021 yeah i don't i don't know if they've been pushed out to 2022 but i think i i i would expect that he's rebooked them because i know he really wants to like set himself yeah, up in vegas well, I, know, I noticed a lot of vegas shows are happening like i just saw ads for brian adams there and stuff but mm -hmm. not that this has anything to do with my book but i was just thinking maybe dave's you know conflict with his end of the road dates maybe that's why they haven't rescheduled yet mm. you know, that might be too. you've seen van halen a couple of times i find it interesting that your sort of rock and roll awakening was van halen on their 1984 tour can you tell us a little bit about seeing them on that on that tour uh sure i will i had never heard of them and somebody um one of my friends from high school had tickets and i just said yes because it was a concert I'd only been to Journey before that. That was my oh. first show. Um, so Van Halen was my second concert, and we had floor seats. And I just remember when David Lee Roth came out on that stage. I don't know. Something happened to me. I've never been the same since. So, yeah, I just, I'm, I was just mesmerized, transformed, obsessed with Van Halen's music, and you know, bought all their. It was cassette tapes back then. Mm. And, you know, memorized all their songs, played them over and over and over. And I still do the same thing. Nothing's changed. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that always brings me back, though. You know, it's um, like, you know, I think I said it in my book, but, like, I've paid a lot for concert tickets to see them. But you know what? Feeling 16 again, priceless. 
Oh, for sure. So, and you've seen them yeah. a lot. You've, you've seen them a lot I'm over the go years. I'm going to go see a band and cover band this weekend. Oh, It'll cool. Um, but yeah, it'll be the first time I've seen live music since COVID. Um, but and yeah, died. Um, I saw, I, when was the last time I saw them? 2015, I think they were their last tour. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the, uh, you know, it's sort of bittersweet that you would have saw them on their last tour with Dave before they split with him and, you know, started again with Sammy Hagar. Back in the day, how did you feel about that change with Sammy and the band? Um, well, I wasn't happy about it. Um, it was like heartbreaking. It mm -hmm. was like the end of the world to me. Uh, I was like, you know, I just fallen in love with them in 1984 and then like they go and break up right after that. Um, but then David Lee Roth had his solo tours, which, oh my God, I, I can't even count how many shows I went to chasing him around uh, my teenage friends and I driving from city to city, you know, we made friends with the management. We got backstage passes and free tickets everywhere we went. And he never came backstage. He just never came backstage. And I wanted to meet him so bad. He never came backstage. And then finally I was in a, when I moved to LA, I was in a club and he was standing right in front of me. And I was like, I swear I was standing there like that. And he kept looking at me and then looking away and then he'd look and look away and I, I was still like that. And then finally he looked at me and he went, hi. And I went, <gasps> <laughs> yeah, so I was so starstruck. Um, but then I went back to that club the next week and I dressed like totally different and put on makeup because that day I'd been at the beach all day. So I was like t-shirt shorts, didn't even plan on going out that night. Yeah, and then, so the, the, next, uh, the next week is when I started talking to him. And, well, he came up and whispered to his bodyguard manager, like, and asked who I was. And I was like, ha, ah, got him. And then, then the flirtation, like, kind of uh, went on. It was like my little silly crush flirtation that nothing really ever came of, obviously, read the book. But I still have this stupid crush on him as if he's still 27 and I'm still 16. Like, I still see him <laughs> that way. It's probably like women that were in love with Elvis, you know, or, or oh. Paul McCartney. They just always see the, the person that way, like young forever. For like, sure. Yeah, it takes you back to a special time. And it seems, I mean, it seems that you at least got some semblance of a friendship out of it. He, he comes across as pretty well in the, in the book. You know what? He was not disappointing, I have to say. Yeah. Like, people always ask me how he was. And I think he gets... And maybe he was different to me because, you know, I'm a girl. But, I, okay, I know I witnessed him be so nice to everyone because I hung out with him countless times, you know, in clubs. And he would always be, have me on his arm. And then he would, fans would come up to meet him. And he would be gracious to everyone and go, and this is Carrie. You know, like, but he, he was always nice to everyone. Like, I never saw him be an asshole to anybody. And mm -hmm. I read so much about like his uh, bad attitude and his big ego and him being an asshole. Yeah, I've read stuff like that so much. And I've, again, I, 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 I know I'm not Neil, no monk. I didn't work with him. Like I didn't, I didn't go on tour with him. Like mm -hmm. I didn't have a, a serious relationship with him. I wasn't in a band with him. So I'm sure they know things that I don't know, but from, yes, from my perspective, I was never disappointed. He was always charming, sweet, kind and um yeah nothing bad to say there well that's great so i want to now pivot to one question about someone who probably can't be described that uh you know nicely um i think one of the most gripping and intense parts of your book is when you write about your relationship with john elway and all the ups and downs there i found that to be, I mean, I'm sure that was very painful to relive and to write, but I found it to be very brave to put that out there, especially because I think, and I wonder if you agree well, with this. I could have said a lot worse things, believe me, so. Oh, I, yeah, I do, I believe that. Now, do you think that sharing those stories in your book is something that other women 
can read and apply to their lives and yes. sort of you know know the signs of you know abuse and mistreatment and know how to um, recognize that thing in their lives a lot of women, uh, friends of mine who have read the book start texting me and when they get that get to that chapter mm -hmm. and like or like oh he was just like my ex da, 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 da. um so you know unfortunately you know there's more where he came from yeah. um you know but he had his good points, but unfortunately, um, like I explained in the book, it's hard to remember, you know, the good stuff once you bury a relationship and you get over it. And it's been so many years that I had to go, what did I see in him anyway? I know I was in love with him. It must have been something. So I had to like dig to like try to remember like, <laughs> why. And then, um, but yeah, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of like abusive, um, fights there unfortunately because they were it you know and uh yeah i still remember some nasty things that he said and unfortunately like i wish i could go to a hypnotist and forget what people say to me sometimes like for instance like you know i don't even remember if this is in the book i like every day i think of more things that i could have put in the book that i forgot to put in the book so mm. now i'm like so confused and i'm like was that in there this is, but yeah like one time i you know he said to me like you know what carrie you know you don't know how to be loved because no one's ever loved you mm -hmm. you know just like hurtful rotten stuff so yeah. i really hope I really hope if I ever in a relationship again, <laughs> you know, that I find someone that doesn't say stuff like that. And I, I hope I don't say things like that to people, because you know what, it's very easy, I guess, you know, when you fall in love, I think it brings out all your stuff, yeah. you know, and you end up taking things out on the people that you love the most. Um, so I think that he hadn't healed from um, some losses in his life, a divorce and a, losing his sister to cancer and his father to a heart attack. You know, I think he was processing a lot of pain and I think um, he would drink too much and, and, and aim it all, all of his hurt on me. And I think he did, he did realize that in the end, but it was, you know, it was too late, but he, he realized he needed to get help and work on himself. And, and he said to me, I, I wish I had met you much later after I had, worked all this stuff out mm -hmm. the damage was like done and you know so i don't keep up with him you know but i know he's married now mm -hmm. so hopefully hopefully he worked his stuff out and hopefully he's having a healthy relationship i wish him all the best and and believe me the first uh, version of my book was not so kind about him um but i did and i did have interestingly my male friends who proofread it, read it for me wanted me to keep all of it. And my publisher wanted me to say even worse things. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it before I self-published it. And I said, you know, I'm not writing this book to take anyone down. Mm -hmm. You know, not that I can take John Elway down. He's much, you know, too rich and powerful for little old me to take down, you know, but so what would be my point, you know, to, uh, smear him uh more to hurt his feelings more i mean i think if if he read the book and i don't know if he did he knows what i know i knew that he wouldn't be mad because he knows that it could have been a lot <laughs> the things i said could have been um a lot worse so i'm sure he wasn't thrilled about it but he also um knows i did him a favor by not getting into other things that i could have well, I mean, at the very least, hopefully he stopped with that sort of behavior. And I think it's brave that you did include even some of the harsher stories in the book because, you know, oh, we... You know that, that, that there was much harsher. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. but but you, was, do, you, you wouldn't want to there, skip I it entirely. In that chapter, there were so many... I, I had to... Like, it was really long. Like, yeah. it was just like... Um, horror story after horror story after horror story and yeah. it's funny because i would read 
I, every time I wrote a chapter, I would call one of my friends that was in my life, you know, around that time. And I would read it to them to see if they remembered anything, you know, that I wow. wasn't remembered. And they all remembered like more about our fights than I did. They'd be like, what about that time he did it? And I'm like, oh yeah. So wow. yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of them. Well, you know, we got to be as a, as a society, we've got to be able to talk about, you know, abuse and mistreatment. And, you know, if you were to skip all that entirely, he would just get away with it. And, uh, you know. Well, he did get away with it uh, with me. And like I said, oh, I right. think yeah. he's probably healed. I mean, he's been married for a long time now. I, I yeah. think she would have left him if he was treating her the way that, well, I don't know what she'd do. I don't know her personally. But, um, yeah, yeah I, I actually put up with a lot before I finally um it was it was hard. I really wanted it to work. I yeah. really did. The the o the only story I remember from that chapter that wasn't like really unpleasant was uh was one that was kind of funny and I'm really glad you did include it was about when you met Peyton Manning. Could you tell <laughs> could you tell us about what meeting Peyton was like? Well, that's um that that I never told. I think I said this in the book. I never told John about it. I kind of wished I did later, but I knew his ego would be so like deflated. So I was sparing his feelings. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, because he spoke. He was supposed to be you know the big deal. You know, and the, and and I met Peyton with John several times. You know, like at Super Bowl, Sports Illustrated parties, events. You know, so you know. He knew I was John's girlfriend, mm -hmm. yet, um, you know, pursued me uh, in Hawaii at a Pro Bowl and had a friend come and get, well, uh, on the presence of inviting my friends and I to a party, got my number, and then he, it was Peyton that started calling. I'm like, uh, you know, because I knew he was there with his wife, and I'm like, where's your wife? And he's like, oh, on the balcony. And I'm like, you do know that um, I'm John. Anyway, so then he started like texting. He wanted me to meet him in Denver. He had some business in Denver. And I'm like, do you want to read like a triple old murder story like in the papers? <laughs> like, like he, John will kill us. And uh, that's crazy. So of course I didn't go. Um, and then I can't remember now. I think John and I might have been broken up fighting. I can't, there were so many fights. I don't remember what, what stage we were in. But um, then we, because we did, we, I remember we were together after that because I was, I was really tempted to like tell him like I told you, but I knew John's fragile ego. So I opted mm -hmm. to not, because everything pissed him off. Like you have to understand, like he would have not ended up mad at Pete in it he would have been mad at me. Like whenever anyone gave me attention, mm -hmm. like if someone came up and asked, asked for my autograph or knew who I was, he would get crazy and accuse me of telling them like who I was. And I was like, um, this event was advertised and now everyone knows I'm your girlfriend. So when people show up with my magazine to sign it, it's because they read that you're going to be there and they know I'm your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't take out an ad and print paper. So I was going to be here. But like he couldn't share the spotlight, you know, like he didn't, he didn't want me getting any attention. So that would have really crushed him. And he would have accused me. Uh, I would have been, it would have been my fault somehow. So later on, you know, it was way after we broke up when I read that he hired Peyton for the Broncos. And I just got a kick out of that. Cause I was like, <laughs> if I had said something, I could have changed the entire course of, football like they could have changed his career like had I opened my big mouth and I said it jokingly in the book like yeah he Peyton should thank me for his career um which was a, uh, that was a joke and I almost took it out but then um a couple of my proofreaders and editors men uh told me that it's it's common knowledge about um Peyton Manning being a notorious philanderer so I wouldn't yeah. They, they were like, you're not saying anything like people don't already know him for. And I was like, oh, okay, because I don't keep up with football. I've never seen a game since John and I broke up. I never saw a game before him. It's not my thing. So mm -hmm. I have like, you know. Well, as, as a, I am a football fan and what it, the story is so wild to me because the one thing that John Elway is like sort of accredited for in his new role in Denver is bringing Peyton Manning. 
everything else has been a disaster. So you could have taken away, if you had told them that, you could have prevented the one thing he gets credit for, which is oh too funny. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a jaw-dropping part of the book. <laughs> well, yeah, like I said, I don't know if he I read about it. He's probably heard about it, but I don't know it's been out for a while. But I have not, I've actually, um, I've been asked by a couple uh, sports um, podcasts to do interviews and I've turned them down mm. um, specifically because I know that's all they wanted to talk to me about. And I do rock and roll because, hey, I'm the rock and roll centerfold and I can talk about rock and roll. I have opinions about rock and roll. Um, I can't, I can't carry, I cannot carry a conversation about sports besides my relationship with LA. And um, I don't know. I just, I really wasn't comfortable. It's only a couple of them, but I turned them down. That makes sense. Okay. So we're getting kind of close to the end of our time here. So I just have one last question for you. And I I will tell you up front, it's, it's only half serious, but I recall another one of my favorite parts of the book is that um, you sort of mentioned that at one point you were privy to some information from another uh, Playboy Playmate who had an affair with uh, like some guy who used to be president. And I looked it up. He's not president anymore. So I don't think anybody would really care if you just want to share some of those stories. I don't think anybody cared. That Actually, that part of my book, uh, when I first read it, well, you know, I had to edit it because it's, it, it's a long book and it was even yeah. longer. I only have so many, you know, pages and I have so many stories. Um, but... And I live in LA. Okay, this is odd enough because I mentioned Betsy Johnson in my book because I did her fashion show in 2001 and that's the first time I met Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And um, I I saw her yesterday at a restaurant in Malibu and I almost went up and said hello, but I wasn't, I don't know. I just really wasn't in the mood. I was with my son and I just, I don't know. I I didn't, I haven't seen her since then. So I, she, I don't know, I probably should have said a lot, but I thought it was interesting, I saw her. But anyway, yes, that story was a lot longer. And again, I had to reread it and go, this is not a book about Karen and Trump. This, that, right. At the time that I was um, in the thick of writing the book, that was a huge thing in the tabloids with Stormy Daniels and all that. And I was really pissed off about it because my name kept appearing in the headlines. And some of them got it wrong. You know, some of them were like, I mean, I have Tom Arnold blocked on my Twitter because he was so fucking annoying. Excuse my language. No, he he was convinced, like he was tweeting that he had some inside information and like the next playmate to come out about her affair with Donald Trump was me. So of course I did, did not have an affair with him. And I said, look, you know, I'm on your side, but I can't help you. I don't have any information that will take Trump down. So my book wasn't out yet. He had somehow got wind of that I knew something, but I didn't know. I didn't know anything that could help him. His mission was to take Trump down. Mm -hmm. Like I unfortunately know I didn't know any uh, secret facts. I didn't have an affair with him. Everything that I knew um, was already in the press. And Karen was desperately trying to get her affair with him known and used my name like as an excuse. And that part um, pissed me off because I did not want my name in the headlines with her and Stormy Daniels. Mm -hmm. And it put me there. And I didn't want, I didn't want that. I didn't want that attention. So um, yeah, that's, that's why I talked about that. But yeah, by the time, by the time I released my book, I was like, nobody fucking cares about Trump's affairs. Like I, like I almost didn't like, I, I talked about it as little as, as little as possible, you know? Yeah. No, no, no juicy details about their, the gross things she did in bed with him, although she did tell me them, but I didn't yeah. feel it. Like, and I was like, this isn't a book about that. No, you wouldn't but, want to put that in the book. Yeah. That'd be, it'd be a little greasy. <laughs> no, no, that's all. That's all yeah, right. No, that was totally about anybody's sex life. It's going to be my own sex mm-hmm. life in my book and, you know, nobody else's. For sure. Okay. Well, looking to the future, I thought I saw something online about um, an Eric Carr documentary in the works. Is that something you yes, could talk yes, about a little yes, bit? 
we've been working on that for a while and um you know we're looking for a november release oh, so wow. we're doing lots of interviews different celebrities we're, i'm working with eric's sister loretta and jack sawyers who's the producer that did the original um 2000 documentary called uh, tale of the fox so oh. um of course i've already besides helping get the talent and produce i'm also um we already did some interviews with me and we're going to do more you know um there's a lot of footage that's never been seen i of course i've seen some of it i never even showed my son never never a soul because eric's sister made me promise never to show anybody because it's coming out with the documentary but it's yeah it's it's extremely touching um yeah yeah it's it'll be really good it's not going to be like the first tale of the box the top it's not like the exact first documentary it's more a celebration of eric's life and explaining um why he continues to grow in popularity you know over the years you know he hasn't been forgotten if anything he's getting more and more well known and you know remembered and um he had a very very few very like jack sawyers the other producer was a close friend of his and his sister and i and you know some um the people that he did have like were a tight-knit group who have, who have made sure you know he will not be forgotten and we've stayed close and he would be very very happy to know that absolutely it is just so wonderful that you're that you're carrying a torch for him and keeping his memory alive you know while also telling your own story in this book and we'll have this great documentary to look forward to in november it sounds like uh i just want to thank you so much for coming on i really did enjoy this book i thought you, your stories were brave i thought uh the 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 you know sex drugs and rock and roll parts of the book were lots of fun i thought you put it together in a very engaging way with a, a beautiful presentation so well done on all that thank you so much for your time today i've enjoyed thank talking you. to you it was fun awesome and that was carrie stevens author of unrated revelations of a rock and roll centerfold once again, I have to thank Carrie for being such a fantastic guest and also for being a great advocate for the music we love on her social media pages. There's a lot of unique, fun, engaging content on her social media pages, so you should definitely find her there. But before that, buy her book. Go to CarrieStevens.com and check out those VIP packages. Otherwise, you can find her at CarrieStevensXO on Twitter and on Instagram. Okay, quick teaser for what's coming up on this show. Our next episode will be part two of our Dylan Through the Decades series. Part one, Bob Dylan in the 1960s, is available right now on our podcast feed. Part two is going to be Bob Dylan in the 1970s, and I will be joined by my friend Chris to go through that, just like the first episode. He'll be joining me for each of these episodes in our mini-series, Dylan Through the Decades. The next episode that I'll be recording solo, I will actually be going back to the 1960s as it will be a deep dive on the Jefferson Airplane. Check that one out. There's a lot of great music connected to that band. And of course, I have more interviews in the pipeline. It's just a matter of getting the actual dates set. So once I have those, I'll announce them on our social media. And with that, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the big four things you can do to support this show that don't cost a dime. Number one, listen to the show. If you're hearing this now, that means you did this part already. Thank you. There is an infinite amount of content out there, so you choosing to spend some time listening to this show means a great deal to me. Number two, if you like what we did here, please recommend this show to family, friends, or anyone you know who's looking for a podcast, particularly about music. Share our links in Facebook groups, subreddits, and recommendation threads. Whatever you can do is highly appreciated on my end. Number three, find us on social media. Follow us on Twitter, at PlayThatPodcast. 
Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash play that podcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash play that rock and roll. Lots of great material like photos and vlogs on all three platforms as Play That Rock and Roll is very much meant to be a content hub as well as a podcast. And finally, the big ask. Number four, please give us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. I know this part is a hassle, but it really does help the show a great deal. Not just because it affects the algorithm, but also because it gives me something I can point to when pitching this show to potential guests. The more social media followers and positive ratings the show has, the better chance I have for booking high-profile guests for interviews. So if you take a moment to give us even just a five-star rating, you are actively giving us a tool to do bigger and better things here. But whatever the case, I appreciate any and all efforts you take to support us here at Play That Rock and Roll. Be sure to join us next time for more great stories and music from the world of classic rock. Waves that call